So there it goes. Okay, uh, 3443, what does that mean? That means 6439, okay. I begin with the Rohingyas being plowed down mercilessly in Burma. We are, of course, asking in the short term for a safe zone protected by UN peacekeeping forces. But the real requirement is a revolution in consciousness, a revolution in consciousness required by UN peacekeepers whose alleged record for rape is scary, and of course by all ethnic cleansers, extreme identitarians, so that when we do identity politics, we should remember it's a taxonomy, we are not unlike them. Extreme identitarians around the world. Time will not allow me to draw out the connections between identitarianism and homelandism. We must at once undo and redo Lenin's definition of a revolutionary that the ruled classes, I quote, have to want in a communist way. Without collective communist desire, Lenin writes, revolutionary upheaval moves in a counter-revolutionary direction. I believe a revolution indicating a systemic change. That's what a revolution is, not just any, I mean, yes, everybody should be able to present everywhere, but the question comes, present what? I believe a revolution indicating a systemic change can only be lasting if there is a constant attempt to create a will for social justice, and it is just that there be law, but law is not justice a constant attempt to produce the subaltern intellectual, an attempt required to counteract the incessant subalternization required by the self-determination of capital within globalized capitalism, even as it gives funding to big festivals. Subalterns are social groups on the fringes of history, such as the Rohingyas, that's Gramsci, social groups on the fringes of history. Therefore, given that you and I are equally caught in a bureaucratically quantified, how many, how many can we fit in? Bureaucratically quantified, egalitarian, summits festivals preaching to the choir, supported by corporate funding and corporate universities, giving up on the responsibility of critical teaching. We are organic to the ideology that lets capitalist globalization survive. <laughs> Not just applause, think upon it, par coeur. And therefore, I must remember with you that as we focus on migrants as we should and must, we forget internal displacement, and we forget subaltern groups. Remember, social groups on the fringes of history, not generalizable. Subaltern groups on the fringes of history because they are below the NGO radar. And believe me, anything that I say here, I'm talking from hands-on experience because my academic qualification is high theory. I'm an elite theorist. English, French, and German literature. That ain't this, but it serves. <laughs> In the 1872 edition of the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels, that's the last big edition. This is not like esoteric archive work. Marx and Engels remarked that the progress of big business in the last 25 years had made the sections on revolution in the manifesto outdated, veraltet. Who remembers this? That they themselves said, this is just a historic document. The, the revolution stuff doesn't work because, in other words, revolutionary strategy is connected to the regulation of capital, whatever revolution might be. In the 145 years from 1872, big business has made strides that Marx and Engels could not imagine. We must not let our tongues hang out fully when today's corporate economy tame us 
by turning opposition into festival, even circus, of self-declared usefulness. Marx presents the proletarian revolution as responding to pushes and shoves from the outside, pushes to keep its promise for a real system change, big and sustained policy change, rather than wait forever for the right planned moment to arrive. Marx does this by way of a story, which many of you know, very famous, which is about not being able to keep a false promise where the guy in Aesop's fable says he can jump across the harbor mouth of Ro at Rhodes through which ships pass. He is told, here is Rhodes, jump here. This is, of course, and also to stage the scientific impossibility of a proletarian revolution or any revolution. Who can jump an entire harbor mouth? And this is Marx. A good way of turning this impossibility into circuses, exhibitions, and festivals is fostered by corporations, rich folks, and crowds mistaken for democracy. In December 2015, a group of European architects announced plans to build a modern colossus bestriding this harbor mouth, two piers at the harbor entrance, despite a preponderance of evidence and scholarly opinion that the original monument could not have stood there. The new statue, 150 meters tall, five times the height of the original, would cost an estimated $283 million, funded by private donations and crowdsourcing. The statue would include a cultural center, a library, an exhibition hall, and a lighthouse, all powered by solar panels, green, sustainable, sustainable underdevelopment. Marx changes from jump to dance, not this kind of stuff. We, in the piece you know, we need to hold on to this dance if we are to understand that revolution cannot be formally defined or created by tremendously well-organized, corporate-funded, self-declared summits. Marx was a formalist in his theory of value the labor theory of value, value, which he famously defined as in halt los, content less, and einfach, simple, regularly translated into English, not as content less, in halt los, but as slight in content, thus closing up the possibility for English readers to understand what Marx was talking about. Value is commensurability, close to data. It's not that hard to understand for us because we have suffered more, although we don't count it as suffering. We dance. Unconditional ethics is ahoy to kiprem. Anyone understands Bengali here? <laughs> Unconditional. <laughs> Unconditional ethics is ahoy to kiprem. Unfocused love, amour sans rapport. Such unconditional ethics must be conditioned when practiced as politics. Democratic freedoms must be bound to particular causes when practiced. This is why Trump is having such difficulty, quote, understanding racialized civil disobedience at the NFL. In the same way, we cannot have a revolution only by policy on the one side or well-organized form by another, unless it is tied to content. That's why I asked, present what? Unless it is tied to content. Marx preserves this double bind through the concept metaphors of dance, poetry, and the overarching figure of theater when he speaks of revolution. We do not know the form of our revolution today. We look forward to a content that we must be able to project by the flexibility of our imagination. Let us read the passage written by Marx 160 years ago. I quote, English translation, the social revolution of the 19th century can only create its poetry, writes Marx, from the future, not the past. Here is the rose, dance here. Here is the rose, here tanze. Marx changes the Greek city name, Rhodos, into its common meaning, rose. Here is the rose, dance here. 
dance to undo the corporations that are making you jump. In my dealings with the organizers of this conference, I have sensed a mistrust of academic intellectuals. I have therefore chosen an example of how academics and art can work together and thus also drag the social group on the fringes of history into this talk. But just remember, not in a voyeuristic way. I work with these people, they're my friends, and they know what I'm doing. First, a conversation with Jacques Derrida reopened. Derrida describes map making, the first writing, as the wounding of the forest rather than the scarring of the soil, I quote. Writing as the possibility of the road and of difference. The history of writing and the history of the road, of the rupture, of the via rupta, broken, of the path that is broken, beaten, fracta, of the space of reversibility and of repetition traced by the opening of the map the divergence and violent spacing from nature of the forest that is natural, savage, salvage, place of safety, break it into map making, first writing. The silva or forest is savage. The via rupta, still derida, is written, discerned, and inscribed violently as difference, as form imposed on the earth as matter as such, end. I insert the feminine transcendental here, in the broken earth of agriculture rather than map making, the furrow, bustrophedon, just what map, map making is not. I give to you that account from the Indic epic Ramayana of Sita, the girl child, emerging from the end of the plow's furrow as marking the skin of the earth, the harsh scarring of the soil with the end of the plow. Now, this is not a well-made thing. The first part was made by some research students not trained to do anything, and the picture parts were, was made by people who, are, who have no, no um, what, machines, no training, no nothing. So the ambient noise is not deliberate distressing. It is part of how it is, okay? So here's slide one. Okay, so this is a this is a this is a, uh, a thing. I don't have the Sanskrit close to me, so I'm not going to read it. That will cut the time. Normally, I read it, but it's kind of far. No, I can read it. Okay, Asame Krishata Kshetram Langala Tuttita Mama Kshetram Shodhaya Talabdha Namna Sita Iti Vishruta Bhutala Tuttita Sa Tu Vyavardha Tamama Atmaja Virya Shulka Iti Me Kanya Sthapita Iyam Ayonija And there you. So Yoni is the one word you probably know here. <laughs> At any rate. The Sita story then is of a female, not born of, but found by a man whose proper name is the giver of birth. When within consciousness, Derrida writes, the name is called proper, it is already classified and is obliterated in being named. It is already no more than a so-called proper name. When within consciousness the name is called proper, it is already classified and is obliterated in being named. This is about voting blocks. This is how the search engines know how to sell specific things to you by way of your proper name. You're in a group, I should know. I have a nice caste Hindu name. The common sense of high theory is proven by something as mundane as spam. When within consciousness the name is called proper, it is already classified and is obliterated in being named. In Janaka, the birth giver's account of Sita's so-called proper name as common noun, we can read a representation of writing in the general sense as we are ourselves that, using the symbolic plow to generate the impossibility of the proper, a father called father. Nobody will catch that here, but Janaka is father. Jana, Genesis, cognate with that word. And a furrow girl called furrow girl, Sita, it's a furrow, turned over in the earth. Here female, we have learned to say not male, going round and round and plowing each season to sustain, not making maps for the Anthropocene. 
This feminine transcendental cannot be captured or represented within marriage in the narrow sense as the establishment of legitimacy. And yet, that's the only discourse available to tie her down. The appearance in the furrow is recounted by her foster father at open court, where Sita is about to choose a noble husband, and her value is given as a bride price. The project is to tie her in the contract of legitimacy, to appropriate her, make her property. At the end of the epic, Sita disappears into the earth, refusing to be tested for fidelity by her husband, also in open court. In her disappearance, her last move, withdrawal into earth, she undoes the violence of the first act of writing on the earth to close the inauguration of the feminine transcendental as writing in general. And uh, there's nobody from my classes here, I've been teaching full time for 52 years, they would know that this is one of the themes around which I teach a lot of women's writing. Anyway. She, uh, so she withdraws the, the, into the, in the inauguration of the feminine transcendental as writing in general. For lack of time, I cannot here ask you to meditate upon the fact that this narrative of the withdrawal of sexual difference as pure trace, as gender differentiation in LGBTQ trans is devolving and staging today, can still only be disclosed as the uncoupling of something like a marriage between the plow and the earth represented as marriage as contractual fidelity. Let us consider how this uncoupling is staged in the final book of the Ramayana. In this passage, I don't have to read this. In this passage, Sita, you know I can read Sanskrit, right? Proving, so I want more time. In this passage, Sita does nothing but speak a syllogism in a lowered voice, as if in a court of law. Every other detail is her adjective. Kasha Vasini, wearing ekru in mourning. Eyes and faces lowered, the translation can't catch this. Hands already cupped in the worshiping, or rather praying mode. In order not to exoticize unnecessarily, think of last names in your own voting block. You know, is it Johnson or Gonzalez? Um, the, and then see that what you have on the screen couples two last names. The first is simply enough, Raghava, of the Raghu dynasty. But Madhavi, same suffix in the feminine, is not the goddess's name, as the translation says. The Sanskrit dictionary says so, by citing the passage in the Ramayana we are reading. Dictionaries are made by human beings. And even in our digital world today, the buck stops with the human programmer. I wish I could go on on this, but 16 minutes and 47 cents, uh, seconds. Standing here as a Bengali, I think of Madhubi, a sweet smelling flower, and know as a teacher of comparative literature that I have not gone far enough. I go back to my high school days and remember that the main noun is Madhu or honey, plus the suffix ah, and then the feminine ending. I beg dominant monolingual or ethnic group bilingual or top-down benevolent multilingual to pray to be haunted by North America's, if not the world's, wealth of languages. Well, that's why I asked if anybody understood my mother tongue. I have remarked in my acceptance speech for the Kyoto Prize on my training in Sanskrit an Indic classical language by Nilima Pine in high school, a low caste woman who would not have been able even to pronounce this language in, the, in her previous generation. The confidence she gave me allows me to say that this name Madhavi, that can serve as adjective to Devi or goddess, can be read as coming from honey as Sita is talking to her and can remind us of the near animist ecological lines where nature is declared as blessing through honey and the dust of the soil is compared to honey, Madhumat Parthivam Rajas, one of many possible invocations of the ecological cycle going round and round to sustain, not making maps for the Anthropocene. She does not address this generalized goddess. She says, as in a court of law, because I have not thought of anyone other than Raghava, therefore the honeyed goddess should give to me her rivara, a reasonable declaration, perfectly appropriate to a court. 
The, the authoritative Sanskrit dictionary gives us the meaning of the word vivara as fisher, whole, think Lacan, those of you who can remember the, um, the uh, dialectical desire. The, uh, fisher, whole, chasm, slit, cleft, hollow, vacuity also applied to the apertures of the body and to gaping wounds, this is a dictionary. If I could think the honeyed ecological cycle as a former high school student, I can think Lacan as Professor Spivak. She asks, Sita asks the earth, in other words, to open wide as the dentist does. Just as what we used to call Bombay talkies has been regularized with reference to the United States as Bollywood, so also this great oral epic has been authorized on the model of the New Testament as the Vulgate, the authorized version. The lines that you see are from the Vulgate. There are, of course, many popular versions. And next we look at one such popular version where Sita speaks a syllogism perfectly suitable to a trial three times. The oral epics, you see how different this is. I mean, I, the translation is by me. The oral epics belong to the country at large and, in fact, are not necessarily confined to Hinduism in its popular manifestations. Here I show one local version that my first cousin Tara Chatterjee mentions as, quote, authoritative, making a mistake, and writes down for me in Bengali script our shared first language, both of us staunch, secular Indian intellectuals. The final three videos offer further supplementation among subalterns, and this is where it's very badly made. Hmm. And notice that it is just here that I suggest that this can be mobilized into violent nationalism, right up there. <laughs> I'm on the Actually, it goes a little, something's wrong with this slide, but that's okay. So, uh, one, our work among the largest sector of the electorate, democracy by body count, is to acknowledge that just as you can learn from them, as my words to my friends on the next video will bear witness, they're also accessed by the elite remark, for example, among many, given to them at all times, Hindu hai hum, ye hai Hindustan hamara. I'm Hindu, therefore this Hindustan, roughly an Arab or Farsi name for India, is mine an Islamophobic and extreme identitarian remark that ought to be questioned in the name of multi-ethnic, multicultural, multilingual, and multi-religious India by us benevolent top-downists, homeland. Do the next one. What's happening? Is this the next one? Yes. <laughs> See that little guy is my student because I run schools there, right? That little guy is my student, right? And um, uh, this is a d detail which will probably get, take me one minute b beyond, but be I was talking to Ben about this and he said this is such a nice detail. You see, the woman, also my friend, they and the, you know, the kid dresses better when he goes to school. They are dressed for the field. The woman turned it into theater. I hadn't asked her, but generally the woman comes with food, right? And so I see that she'd stand up and later we were gonna have lunch together. So clearly there was no food. And so she filled her little basket with stones and she came to play the woman offering food, right? So she actually, it was just, to show how the pharaoh is, but she turned it into theater. And later, my supervisor, who couldn't understand anything of what's going on, he shows, because in this field, we do ecological agriculture, right? So he suddenly says in the middle, in the next video, you'll see, hey, the potatoes are out. 
he will say. And so my student, the, the, their, their grandson, he runs off to get the potatoes. So it's very mixed genre, okay? Mixed, <laughs> mixed genre, not deliberately distressed film, uh, video. Okay, so where was I? Uh, the final three videos offer further supplementation among subalterns. And notice that it is just here that I suggest that this can be mobilized into violent nationalism, etc. The, um, I have long been well acquainted with the reality of that ancient instrument, langala or plow, mentioned in the Ramayana because of my 30 years work in the villages. My co-workers and generally, did the next one come? My co-workers and generally the landless there are too poor to afford tractors. So they are still actually plowing with the langol and oxen. Although my cousin Tara Didi's helper tells her in urban Calcutta that there are no langolers anymore. Sanctioned ignorance, even among the domestic helpers of the Calcutta middle class, which is why I say this is below the NGO radar. I have learned the rudiments of the command language nuanced with affect used to communicate with the plastic. No. See, he's going to run to pick up, pick the potatoes. And these are social groups out in the fringes of history. I could actually go on to say how they suffer from the state. But they're my friends, they're actually teaching the Whitney Biennale something about how Sita arose. Because, because, in fact, the organizer at the Whitney was unable to recognize the plow in these videos because the machine does not dominate the animate beings. She is used to huge tractors with a little guy or a female. The strict binary opposition between machine and animals is incorrect, of course, and therefore untenable. But here it becomes politically necessary with the sense that that one is giving up correct theory. The machine is driven by human beings and animals together. It is very small, and it will not work if the human being cannot speak to the animals. In conclusion, I move from the common name of the non-man, speaking to animals, and go another step, showing an intellectual undertaking, working with creative performance. Shankho Ghosh, arguably the most important poet writing in Bengali today, and in response to repeated identitarian requests from New Jersey corporatist Bengalis, and I are putting together a bilingual multi-volume series of Bengali texts from the end of the 12th century to the present day. To give you a sense of how elite the project is, here is a picture of a page of Plato's Republic Book 8 in the Loeb Classical Library published by Harvard University upon which our series is based. We have asked Shantosh Karmukar, a landed rural high school teacher, not a subaltern, to collect examples of the rural oral tradition. He tells me that his life has changed as he pursues his fieldwork, this fieldwork. He is learning how to compose in some of those traditions. And he's composing so that the traditional practitioners, who will judge, of course, because he's a new composer, but also they can connect their cultural conformity. You see, this is the mistake. We who do this kind of reverse classism, when we hear that, we say, oh my goodness, they're revolutionaries. No, they're conforming to their culture as we conform to our globalized capital culture by uh, behaving as if we are radicals. So to an end, they don't even, uh, they just sing well. They don't even pretend that they're being radicals as we do. So at any rate, he is learning how to compose in some of those traditions and composing so that the traditional practitioners can connect their cultural conformity to contemporary political tasks. And if they, if they agree with us, it is because millennially, they're, they're not dumb. Their rule, when benevolent ruling class comes and says one thing or the other, is to smile and agree. It doesn't mean that they're radicals like us exactly. As a, so the, um, how to, and composing so that the traditional practitioners can connect their cultural conformity to contemporary political tasks. 
As I told his daughter, who helped make the videos, I wanted to see intellectual, subaltern, I want to show that Santosh, the intellectual, is learning from the subaltern, learning how to teach them, as Antonio Gramsci wanted, in song, and also doing linden or exchange, as in the baul or local minstrel style. The songs happen to be about Sita. I will read my comments slowly before I play clips of Santos singing. The first one, when he sings, Ishpater Sita Chai Amader, we want the Sita of steel. He intuits the steely and syllogistic rationality of Sita in the courtroom, ignored for thousands of years by almost one and all and he criticizes the theocratic state structure that is beginning to infect India. Remember, he's not a singer, he's a high school teacher. Ispater sita chai amader, chai na goshonar sita, aj sita di beko gne porikha. Ke khatiyar ke je bhijal, agune ye bulye di bekta. Sita di beko vini polika. Is pater sita chai amader. Chai na gosho nar sita. Yam na chai na gosho nar sita. Sita di beko vini polika. Now, when he sings, when he sings in the second song, Sita amar matir me. Rajbadi te thake na. Sita's earth girl doesn't live in palaces. He confronts the subaltern with the devastation of primary production in that area, with the exploitation through the high production seduction of chemical fertilizers and genetically engineered seeds. Sita ya marmatir me Rajbadi te thake na Dono bege ram sita nilo, jono rakte parlo na. Ogo sita ya mar matir me, rajbadi te thake na. Okay, now then the very last line of the last one, mati te sita khuji, amra arto kutha jabo na. We look for sita in the soil we won't go elsewhere, brings forth the injunction to want to save the soil by way of biopolitical metaphors scorned by elite theorists. A possibility that has been destroyed in the new Khilafat, but of course I can't go into that narrative, two minutes and seven seconds. In the picture of the plow, see, trains run on time. In the picture of the plow, you see one of the subalterns who speak to me, saying we cannot yet transform all production ecologically because we are poor, one of the guys, the guy who's doing the plow. Now the thing is, this is wrong of course, but I give whatever explanations I can, but I have to wait to see if I have been able to rearrange these desires, work from the inside, imagine, in the other side, which is why this is this kind of a one-shot deal is it has to be extremely harsh and so on and so forth. Work from the inside. So are learning from the subalterns how to teach them. I wish, and if you learn from the elite also how to teach them, I teach after all also in the PhD program at Columbia. I wish there were time to tell you about the anti-child marriage lesson. That was complicated. No. The poetry of the future is not global. Let's listen to the very last one, where he's talking about, we are looking for Sita in the, in the... Sita jane na cholka pati, obhi mane tar phadilo mati. Sita jane na cholka pati, obhi mane tar phadilo mati. Pata le gyalo mati ri biti, pata le gyalo mati ri biti. Otai mati te bhaale sona yoga mati. Sita 
সীতাই আমার মেটির মেয়ে তাই বাড়িতে থাকে না সীতাই আমার মাটির মেয়ে তাই বাড়িতে থাকে না Baba. He's had it. See, he's not a singer. So anyway, so the so no, the poetry of the future is not global. It offers a dangerous supplement of the incalculable through the world's wealth of languages to the uniformizing global. I cannot explain this sentence because you have limited me 37 seconds. You have limited me with the bureaucratic quantified egalitarianism of events preaching to the choir that matches capitalist globalization, supported by corporate funding summits festivals. Not my comfort zone. The poetry of the future is growing elsewhere. We cannot attend to it, for we cannot get around our will to power even if it is the absolutist will to the power to, quote, help our mysterious world. Thank you. One.